provide any resources uh, uh, that anybody's interested in. So I grew up, well, it's not 20 miles from here, it's 20 miles from where I practice, uh, Homewood Flossmoor, the south suburbs of Chicago. Uh, I studied at Duke and uh, studied biomedical engineering, mechanical engineering, and uh, one of our classes was devices for the disabled people, and so we were tasked with figuring out how to make a device that would let a quadriplegic play the trombone, and I thought that was super cool, and that's what led me to medical school, University of Illinois. Um, that on the left is a bolt cutter, and as far as I know, orthopedic surgery is the only discipline in which you're allowed to use a bolt cutter in the operating room, so uh, I was sold, I was in. So I had the uh, uh, fortunate pleasure to uh, do my training at the uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, that's sort of a place where they focus on the most complex, difficult, and unique patients from around the world. So. When somebody in another country or another state or anywhere doesn't know what to do with somebody, they send them to the Mayo Clinic and uh, we try to figure it out. And so I got to see a lot of interesting, amazing patients. This is uh, Amarachi. She's a 12-year-old uh, uh, Nigerian girl who uh, flew to the Mayo Clinic because uh, she was told by the doctors there that uh, she was going to be confined to a wheelchair within the next year. And this is her walking. She was in a lot of, uh, a lot of pain and having uh, a lot of difficulties. And uh, using some of the technology that Dr. Reuter talked about earlier, uh, including a table of facial frame, which involves a lot of math and calculus, uh, we were able to uh, straighten out her legs and get her uh, walking and able to uh, live a functional life uh, without uh, being confined to the wheelchair. Um, she was in frames for about five months. Uh, and um, three of those months were the correction phase. You actually get a, there's a computer program that does the math and the patient gets a prescription and has to turn each of the wrenches a certain amount each day so that correction takes place over time uh, as Dr. Ruder was showing. The frame looks exactly the same as the one he had on the foot but you can put them elsewhere on the body uh, as well. Some of the other things that I was fortunate enough to do and see were complex tumor and pelvic reconstructions, basically uh, the worst of the worst cancers that people said were inoperable, inoperable and nobody knew what to do with. Uh, we would do surgery and this is an x-ray of somebody who has undergone a hemipelvectomy with a partial sacrectomy. So uh, that's one of the largest surgeries that a human can endure. It takes about 24 hours and a couple of teams of surgeons and you essentially cut someone in half uh, and you do that for uh, bad pelvic cancer. And uh, after patients undergo these type of surgeries, in the past what they would say is, listen, you know, you're know, you lucky to be alive and you're gonna be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of your life because you're missing half your pelvis. There's no way to put a prosthesis on uh, um, someone who doesn't have a pelvis. And so uh, we thought, there's got to be a better way. So we got together with our prosthetists, our physical therapists, our uh, rehab doctors, and uh, designed a prosthesis that could be worn by someone with uh, a hemipelvectomy or hip disarticulation. And we started putting patients in them and rehabbing them aggressively. And it worked. And so uh, this is a paper that I published in the, uh, uh, in the literature to uh, describe our experience with uh, successful prosthetic rehabilitation in these patients to hopefully encourage other institutions to uh, give this a try and uh, give these patients a shot. So uh, after Mayo, I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, spend a, a year out at Harvard Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston uh, focusing on complex hip and knee reconstruction. So uh, if the Midwest, the worst of the worst, nobody knows what to do with, they send to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Um, on the East Coast, if nobody knows what to do with it, they uh, send it to Brigham Women's. So these are a couple of x-rays of my favorite patients on the left. This is a patient who had undergone four previous failed hip replacements and was on number five. And uh, unfortunately, the defect in the bone in the acetabulum right here was so big that there is no commercially available uh, hip replacement socket that is big enough to fill that defect. And so we used a technique uh, called the double, tech, double cup technique that was pioneered by one of my mentors, Dan Estock, where you uh, take two hip replacement cups, you cut a wedge out of one of them, and put them together in order to make a, uh, a hip replacement that'll uh, work for the patient. And that patient was able to uh, get up walking and uh, living their life. On the left is a uh, uh, example of post-traumatic arthritis. So this was a patient that had experienced a fall and a fracture, had that fracture fixed, but unfortunately 
the knee joint wore out and uh, she needed a knee replacement. The problem is all of the plates and screws in that leg are exactly where we normally put the guides to do a knee replacement. So um, this down here is a computer navigation device that we were able to use uh, to navigate around all of the screws in the plate in order to uh, miss them all by about a millimeter and give her a uh, well-aligned, uh, well-functioning total knee replacement so she was able to uh, uh, get up walking and uh, pain-free and living life. So then what brought me here and uh, Northwest Indiana is a great community in need of a uh, fellowship trained joint replacement surgeon in Crown Point. Uh, there were no fellowship trained joint replacement surgeons so I wanted to go somewhere where uh, they needed my help. And so this is one of my favorite quotes from one of the Mayo brothers, the founders of the Mayo Clinic, the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. So. Uh, my three areas of interest are number one, ensuring accuracy and avoiding complications in surgery, not just joint replacement, um, pain control in surgery, and then uh, speedy recovery to a uh, full functional level. And so the question of the day is always, how do we do an accurate surgery technically for each patient, avoid any complications, cause a minimum amount of pain, and get them back to the activities and the life they want as fast as possible. And so the first part of this is I plan all my surgeries on the computer and uh, I use a lot of my engineering background in order to uh, figure out all of the cuts, all of the angles, all the sizes of everything beforehand um, because it uh, increases accuracy. It decreases surgical time because if you already know what components and equipment you're planning on using, you don't have to figure anything out. Uh, it decreases inventory waste because you don't try to fit something in there that doesn't fit. And uh, my favorite is that it uh, avoids complications. And so this is an x-ray of a patient who had a hip replacement placed and this cable says to an orthopedic surgeon that uh, when this hip replacement was placed, it, uh, the bone was broke, the bone was broken. And so that's why they had to put the cable around it uh, to fix it. And um, there's some surgeons that would say that this is an unavoidable complication, that sometimes this, uh, this just occurs and um, there's nothing we can do about it, but the picture on the left is a, a computerized plan of that same patient. Uh, and if you see what I've written there, it says above 11 equals crack, and that's a size 13 hip replacement. So if we would have had, the surgeon would have had that plan beforehand, they would have been able to avoid that complication you know, before the skin was even cut. Uh, and so the next area of interest for me is uh, pain control. We've made a lot of advances on pain control in the, uh, in the last decade and even the last few years. So the mantra at Mayo is if, uh, if you have an idea or you have a thought or an opinion, prove it. So you design a study in order to prove it. So we were using a uh, local pain medication, both in trauma and joint replacement surgery, that uh, helped decrease the risk of, uh, uh, of pain but also didn't rely on peripheral nerve blocks, which are the anesthesiologists numb the nerves going to the area. Uh, those are great for pain control. The problem is they also numb all the muscles going to the area, which slows rehab. Uh, and so uh, we wanted to see if there was a better way to do it. And so one company had come out with medication that cost $315, and they'd been using that uh, medication in surgery. Uh, the combination of our block uh, was about 18 bucks, and we published a uh, three-armed randomized prospective uh, clinical control trial comparing those three pain control techniques and basically found that um, the $18 block was equally effective as the other two, had uh, decreased risk of complications, uh, increased patient satisfaction, quicker rehab, and lower hospital stays, so uh, all good things. Uh, pain control in the OR uh, or post-op starts pre-op, and so I have a, uh, a pain control regimen that I start even the night before surgery so that after surgery, uh, patient's narcotic usage is uh, as much decreased and their recovery is, is increased. So I'm here to talk about hip replacement approaches. There's three main approaches to the hip. Uh, each has their advantages and disadvantages. I was lucky enough to be trained in all three of them, and all three of them have their uh, uh, their time when you would want to use them, but I'm going to talk about the anterior approach. So uh, hip replacements used to be like this, where you have this huge wound and you're in bed for days. Uh, it's no longer like that. Uh, 
Now uh, I have patients up walking the same day of surgery, so if they have surgery at eight in the morning, they're walking around by lunchtime. Uh, smaller incisions, we uh, have the pain control protocol that means that most of our patients don't require narcotic pain medications at all, uh, and they're able to uh, rapidly return to uh, work and uh, school, uh, or I'm sorry, work and sports with, uh, with no restrictions. And so the anterior approach is probably more appropriate for more active and skinnier patients. There's some studies that show that it has an earlier walking and a faster recovery, and, uh, and also that patients have decreased post-operative pain. That uh, drawing on the left there is a view of the hip from the back. So the posterior approach, which is the kind of standard traditional uh, approach, you need to cut all of these muscles here, these short external rotators, and then at the end of the surgery, you try to sew them back together. Uh, but they never heal as well as uh, they were, and uh, your risk of dislocation uh, with you know, re-tearing those muscles where you repaired them is, is, is higher. And so uh, the advantages are you don't require post-operative dislocation precautions uh, with an anterior approach, at least I don't, and uh, it doesn't require cutting of the muscles, it just requires spreading of them, which you'll, uh, you'll see in the lab here in a moment. Uh, we also able, are able to use a generally a smaller incision my favorite thing about it though, is it allows you to use an x-ray machine in the OR. So I make a surgical plan that looks like this on the left, and then we can execute that plan while verifying that every single step of the way, we're doing exactly what we thought we were doing with that plan. Uh, and we can use an x-ray to show ourselves that. So there's never any surprises. We're not leaving the operating room saying, wow, we made that patient's leg too long, or there was an unrecognized break in the bone or something that uh, we would be concerned about. And so, uh, my preoperative plan in, includes where all the bone cuts are going to be, the size of the acetabular component, the cup, the uh, size of the head, uh, the size of the stem, and uh, the position of all the components, as well as how much you're planning on either lengthening their leg or moving it out to make it more stable. Uh, so I'm going to run you through the approach real quick. Uh, the skin incision is usually about 10 centimeters, which is about that big. Uh, and um, make a skin incision and you move the tensor fascia lot out of the way, go down to the uh, capsule, you have to uh, ligate the uh, ascending branch of the medial circumflex artery and uh, then use an x-ray to decide exactly where your, your cut is going to be. You expose the acetabulum, you ream it, clean it out, and you put a cup in there and like I said you can use the x-ray machine to, to see exactly what you're doing. And then sometimes you use additional screws to hold it in place. And then on the femur side, you have to uh, release some soft tissue in order to be able to get a good look at it. You put brooches in there and then finally put the uh, final x-ray in there. And then you can, or I'm sorry, the final component in there. And then you can measure the uh, uh, leg lengths and uh, size of the components to make sure everything's okay. Uh, and you test it for stability to make sure it's not gonna pop out of place. Put the real one on take the x-ray afterwards. So, just to recap, um, the anterior approach has uh, a smaller incision. It's more minimally invasive. We have people up walking the same day of surgery and um, our new pain control strategies are able to get people to rehab faster and back to the activities they love sooner. So, this is uh, one of my mentors. This is Dr. Franklin Sim. He is seven. I think he just celebrated his 77th birthday. Uh, he's been operating continuously since he was 30 years old. Uh, and every person who's trained at the Mayo Clinic in that entire time period has gotten to be his intern. And so this was when I was his resident. And uh, he's a workaholic and he's there at four in the morning and there till midnight. And so one of his famous quotes is always be willing to see a patient anytime, anywhere. So if there's anybody that I can help in any way, I'm always happy to see anybody. And so those are my contact information. And uh, if you have a patient that you want to bounce an idea off of or that are having hip pain or knee pain or any pain, um, give me a call anytime. So thank you. And let's go to the lab.